Movies and TV shows that depict police killing a civilian never disappoint in leaving a bad taste in anyone's mouth. I think this has to do mostly with the way laws are structured so broadly that police officers are rarely charged or convicted when someone dies at their hands. This phenomena was actually amplified by these movies and TV shows. For decades now, pop culture has been telling the American audience that there's almost no such thing as a bad shooting by a police officer. This has been a topic of debate since forever, and I'm here to give my take on it. Hi, I'm Ice and welcome to my channel. What I'm about to elaborate on is based on a fascinating story by Alessa Rosenberg, published on the Washington Post under the title In Pop Culture, There Are No Bad Police Shootings. During the last few years, Americans have been reacting over and over again with grief mixed with anger and horror to the killing of civilians by the police. According to the Washington Post Police Shooting Database, police in the United States have shot and killed nearly 1,000 people annually since 2015. Despite all that, popular culture continued to turn out stories that justify and even lionize officers who killed. First, it turned shootings into acts of last resort by noble policemen, and later into exciting executions of dangerous villains. All of it was based on myths promoted by Hollywood that result in a near automatic presumption of guilt of those killed by police, whether they were a fleeing person or just an individual in his car with his family. In Supreme Court Tennessee v. Garner 1985, the Supreme Court declared that officers couldn't shoot fleeing suspects simply to stop them from escaping. In Graham v. Connor 1988, it established a standard of objective reasonableness for police shootings, where a reasonable cop in the same situation would have decided to open fire. These two cases set the national legal standards for officer-involved shootings. Shootings. What pop culture did basically was whitewashing the behavior of police officers and depicting the bar for competence and coolness under extreme pressure as impossible to meet by the police, while training audiences to excuse almost any police shootings. In the 1950s and 1980s, Los Angeles Police Department cleared script for TV series such as Dragnet and Adam 12. They stated that shootings that was done in the shows were squeaky clean and that officers would have to be in total control. In fact, in early cop shows such as Dragnet 1951 and Naked City 1958, police officers were presented so decent that they questioned their own decisions to shoot and had to be convinced by a parent or a relative that they'd done the right thing. In real life, a crime wave began in the 1960s and as it endured, fictional police officers who expressed self-doubt after killing someone became increasingly rare. In the detective 1968, Frank Sinatra's principled cop resisted efforts to cover up a bad police shooting. In the 1970s and 1980s, TV and movie officers emotionally debilitated by fatal shootings were depicted not as principled but as weak. The archetypical executioner was Clint Eastwood's Harry Callahan, the embittered main character in the 1971 movie Dirty Harry. Harry began the movie deeply at odds with civilian authorities disgruntled by his quick trigger finger. In 1980's Die Hard, one of the defining movies in cop canon, Al Powell played by Reginald V. Johnson, the patrolman who came to the aid of John McClane played by Bruce Willis, explained that he had been in exile to a radio car for oversensitivity. I shot a kid. He was 13 years old. It was dark. I couldn't see him. He had a ray gun. Looked real enough. Powell explained, you know, when you're a rookie, they can teach you everything about being a cop except how to live with a mistake. Anyway, I just couldn't bring myself to draw my gun on anybody again. The climactic triumphant moment in Die Hard came when Powell regained the courage he needed to shoot the right people, taking down the surgeon.
surviving member of the crew that had commandeered Nakatomi Plaza. There were exceptions to these celebrations of trigger-happy cops, of course. David Simmons' 1991 book Homicide and the television show adapted from it explored how policing was corrupted when departments shied away from taking responsibility for officer-involved shootings. And in 1983 on Hill Street Blues, Mike Paris, played by Tony Paris, shot a child playing with a toy gun, mistaking a shadow on a wall for a real weapon. Perez received absolution from the child's mother. Hell Street Blues suggested that Perez would punish himself worse than any court could. By the end of the episode, he had attempted suicide. Though even the deaths of children were forgivable, there is one category of police shootings that pop culture through the decades has placed beyond the pale. Incidents in which officers shot and killed other cops. The ultimate sin. And in a nifty bit of framing, pop culture tended to suggest that the very act of killing another officer expels a cop from the fraternity, stripping him or her of his identity as police officer. In the 1973 movie Serpico, the officers who tried to assassinate Frank Serpico, I may have misspelled that, but anyway it's the character played by Al Pacino, the officers who tried to assassinate him, those who attempted to blow the whistle on departmental corruption, ultimately proved themselves less loyal to the Valley's New York Police Department than Serpico himself. In Insomnia, Al Pacino would reverse roles, playing a cop who shot his partner in confusion of the Alaska fog. It first seemed like a tragic error, but later became proof that he was losing control of himself. To be true, it's not just bad police shootings that are missing from much of pop culture, but also the truth of police officers' reactions when they fire a fatal round. Part of the problem is that Hollywood portrays police-involved shootings as a common occurrence for individual officers. In reality, they are rare. In 2014, the most recent year for which numbers are available, 35,000 officers of the New York PD discharged their weapons only 79 times. Of those incidents, 35 fell under the category of intentional firearms discharged during adversarial conflict. Another 18 happened when an officer shot an animal. When they do fire, it's also hard for real cops to shoot with the same precision that their fictional counterparts do. Marge Granderson, played by Frances McDormand, the heavily pregnant Midwestern cop at the center of Jules and Ethan Cohen's pitch black comedy Fargo, although I'm not sure it's actually a comedy, managed to keep her balance well enough to shoot to disable her quarry, even as he slipped and slid across a frozen lake. Stories like these draw us directly to the contradiction and how both Hollywood and our police departments think about officers and guns. We want cops to draw their guns rarely, but to be outstanding shots when they do unholster their weapons. We want the police to feel the full weight of taking life, and yet to pull the trigger in a state of perfect calm and conviction. In this story, Alessa did not say much about the people who find themselves on the wrong end of police officers' guns, batons, and fists. That's not because the rosters of the dead, both fictional and real, are unimportant, but rather because pop culture rarely tells stories from their perspective, and police stories face particular challenges in trying to humanize the people who die when cops pull the trigger. When police officers are the main characters in stories and when those officers kill, the basic gravity of storytelling generally compels artists to sympathize with the cops rather than with the people who end up dead. For stories that humanize people killed by the police, we have to look instead to fiction when police officers are secondary characters. That's about it. See you in the next one.